from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills, brought to you by TheUnshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now on this journey with The Unshackled, we've met plenty of like-minded people. I've interviewed many of them on this show, but the alt media world is actually quite large and I'm still coming across new bloggers, YouTubers and podcasters all the time. Uh, today I want to introduce you to Aldea. She's an Aussie YouTuber who comments on the culture wars, immigration and other current events. Here's just a taste of her channel. So how's your day? Uh, um, I it's getting more hectic, each day gets more hectic, but I'm getting there, like work is just consistent. Uh, yeah, my back, I know, my back is sore. Oh. You're feminist or something? No, what? What? What did you just call me? She's interviewed high-profile people, including New York Times contributor Lauren Enriquez, uh, Islam Reformation advocate Imam Tawidi, and Joy Villa, who's the singer who wore the MAGA dress at the 2017 Grammys. I thought it'd be great to sit down and have a chat with her on some of the hot topics of the present day. Dia, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, we've both been in alt media for a number of years, but we only learned about each other uh, last week. So I can get to know you a bit better and our audience can. Can you describe your journey to YouTube? Yeah, um, YouTube initially for me was something I was sort of bored with my life and I fancied myself a funny person. I thought, oh, I'm funny. People, This will be a fun hobby that I do on the side outside of my work life because work life was fine. I, I didn't hate my job or anything, but it was the routine and it just it just it was depressing me. So I thought, well, let's 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 do something different. Um, so I started doing real comedic skits and I had all my friends involved and doing that kind of stuff. But eventually, I lost momentum with that. I did I did a fair few videos, but I, I did lose momentum very quickly. So then I just stopped. And for like two or three years after that, I did nothing with my YouTube channel. But I was still using YouTube as a frequent uh, viewer. And that's when I started noticing a shift happening. Um, like Stephen Crowder was like my first sub. And then I saw all these things happening with Christians versus atheists. And then YouTube kept evolving and evolving. And then I saw that Christians and atheists were becoming friends. And then the new sort of thing to mock was like uh, feminism and stuff. And then that's when I was like, oh, I have a lot to say about this. So my two cents, I, I wanted my two cents. So I sort of reactivated my channel, so to speak, and then started up again. And um, that was that was a, that was two three years later, and then I've, I've kept going because the motivation is still there. Yeah, it was around that 2015, 2016 period when uh, the university students went crazy on campus when I think a lot of us ca came across what, what's termed the, the anti-SJW scene. We're all there saying, whoa, these people are completely out of control, saying basically our whole society is racist, sexist, uh, whatever. We, we need to f fight back against this. And it's interesting you're not the, the first YouTuber who I've come across who probably started different, but when this... Uh, a movement burst onto the scene, you, know, you immediately reacted to it. Yeah, I did. Um, I, did, I don't know why I did, but I felt like I had to have my say. Yeah, you're very right. That's I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that other people had the same evolution. Now, uh, so that was your great uh, revelation, uh, w would you say? Were you politically minded uh, beforehand? I wasn't politically minded in the context of actual politicians and actual politics, no. But I was always very much someone who was uh, well aware of world issues. Um, I consider myself a moral absolutist to a degree. I understand that there's grey area. I'm not like that that naive. But um, I, I I was always interested in, in certain subject matters, as even as a kid. Like I would love watching movies with with the subject matter of racism and stuff like that. Those things always, like things that make you angry and passionate were always things that I liked. But it wasn't until 2015, 16 that I started, um, as I said, Stephen Crowder was my first sub. And through Stephen Crowder, I came to know Miley Yiannopoulos. And I came to know all these other figures. 
and um, at the same time, I've, I've never been interested in politics in the terms of politicians, but I did love watching the Republicans and the debates um, during the preliminaries. And I started watching that for some reason, and I don't even know why I was watching it, and I got really into it. Trump wasn't my pick, but um, he obviously I love Trump now, but he wasn't my pick. But um, yeah, so I don't know what happened to me, but um, I was never a political person, but um, I definitely uh, am interested in that stuff now. I, I'm in, uh, curious to know, did your uh, family uh, upbringing play any part in uh, your views, or are you pretty much a solo vessel? No, um, so I was sort of raised, my mother is an ex-Catholic, my father is a deist, for lack of a better word, he's not a believer in anything in particular, but um, he hates any form of organised religion, as do I, but uh, my mother is someone who was comes from a very, she's Colombian, very, very Catholic, um, so even, but she wanted us to be raised with some level, me and my sister and my brother, with some level of faith some some level of biblical um, understanding and so and my dad actually wanted that too so he wanted us to be raised with because you know I think the old-fashioned thought is that if you have some level of God in your life you're probably a good moral person like that's that tends to be the thought at least Christian based not I'm not talking Islam or anything else like that so uh, but the thing is I was raised in sort of a, a, a religious war because like even though my father sort of would drive us to church and wanted us to do all those things. He would always be like, "So what you learn at the bullshit today?" Like it was always like, "Oh, did you? What, what was the bullshit you learned today?" Really, just like to egg my mother on. But my mother ended up um, in Australia becoming a born again Christian. So we were raised um, born again Christian. But what I'm, I consider myself non-denominational. I don't have a particular Christian category because I think for myself and um, I, I choose to. To retain my 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 Christian foundations, that's important to me. But um, critical thinking is also important to me. Personal responsibility is also important to me. But um, I, even with all that, I still found myself siding with a lot of things that were happening on the left. Like I was very much, I'm not going to say I was a lefty because I never was, but I, I very much um, favoured a lot of thoughts and opinions that went that way. But now, um, as someone who is always checking herself. I, I very much see um, why I thought those things when I was younger and why I thought Barack Obama was great and why Rosie O'Donnell was, why I thought she was great. Like I, I know that I was sort of, yeah, I know why I was conditioned to believe that they were great because I was being told that they were great. So I was like, oh, they're great. But um, now looking back at all the conversations that she did on The View and all that kind of crap, I look back and I go, man, I was an idiot back then. Because, yeah, so I, I, could, I can safely say that I've always lent right politically but there were certain things that made me left but now i'm not left at all <laughs> oh it's your upbringing it's it's quite interesting that you had those two contrasting views from, from each parent uh, mm. uh, on the one hand you had the the devout christian view and then you had the uh you know hardline uh, atheist yeah I, he wasn't an atheist he, he, he wanted us to have a uh, christian a uh, christian base but um, yeah, he definitely um, he hates fanatics. He hates fanatics, my father. Now we're both uh, Australian, and we're probably yes. both concerned about the uh, direction of, of this nation, basically because it doesn't appear like well, not just us, but a lot of people aren't getting a say in this country's direction. I mean, the political correctness is uh, rampant. I mean, for example, if a politician, you know, says something which is interpreted as offensive against, you know, a minority group, they have to uh, apologize, grovel for forgiveness. We have all these mm -hmm. social engineering uh, pushes through, you know, gender neutral language and uh, yeah. safe schools. And it, it just, uh, I, I'm still trying to figure out how do we, you know, cut through to, and I know that you, you know, said you're not focused on politics per se, but but that's where we're going to get the the real cultural change. Well, yes, no, you're not wrong. Um, well, it's funny you bring the schools into it because the whole safe schools thing is is a big subject right now, and um, I have a little niece and I have um, a new nephew. And I hate the thought that they're going to be taught and shown diagrams of, of how gay people have anal sex and um, and what like 
what you're supposed to do if you want to self-satisfy and masturbation and all those sorts of things. It's if it's if if we're supposed to rely on our government, we're we're ending. We're gonna we're going to self-implode. It's it's scary to think about because these are things people have been saying for years. Keep God out of schools. So if you're going to keep God out of schools and the Christians had to deal with, or the Catholics and whoever, the religious folk had to deal with a separation of church and state, if that's a thing, then it has to be a thing the other way around as well. Keep your ideology, keep your leftist ideology out of schools as well. Go to school, learn your facts, learn your history, learn everything you need to learn, and then go home and let your churches and let your parents and let your mosques and let your temples do all of the the, the moral stuff. You know, don't, 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 don't allow schools to do that, and um, it's a big issue because if the, if the government is going to dictate what you have to learn, then you got to have, you should put your kids out and homeschool them. Uh, basically, I think parents have been too trusting of schools Absolutely. that sort of thought that, oh, I'll send my children to school, I trust that they're going to get a, a, a good education, but now a lot of parents, like their children are coming home and saying, well, you know, we learn you know, what, what you described uh, yeah. in the classroom, and they're, they're like, what? And even yeah. even now, there's still there's still not much, not enough reaction. It's uh, Australians are are a bit too passive in this regard. We, you know, we do get uh, you know, outraged about cricket, it seems, but uh, there, there's still a long way to go to you know m make the, the the school educators basically wake up and you know this shouldn't be in the classroom. Right, Aussie nation. <laughs> um, I think something that, that is a compliment to Australians is that for so many years we're seen as, you know, pretty chill, laid back, you know, CBF, we don't care about this, we don't mind that, we're just laid back. But um, because the, 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 the leftism slowly is infiltrating its way into our education and our government and um, it's starting to, to, to affect us socially, culturally, we need to we need to start kicking up a fuss, even though it's it's not very Australian to do that. We need to do it, you know, to get to get back to be able to to get back to the point where we just don't care and we're, we're being laid back. To get back to that, we need to care right now. And we've also lost, uh, you know, through this attitude, our our free speech. Uh, obviously, everybody knows uh, 18C of the the Racial Discrimination Act, but there's a whole bunch of other anti-free speech laws in Victoria. We have the the Racial and Religious uh, Tolerance Act, which we uh, saw uh, three Patriot activists uh, get uh, found guilty of uh, in insulting uh, Islam, and then the Black of course, there's, yeah, and then there's the Australian Human Rights Commission, which. Uh, you know, basically has all these you know advertising campaigns and you know their commissioners. We used to have Gillian Triggs, now we have Tim Supomasani, basically you know saying how you know horrible and racist we are all the time, and you know really uh, you know belittling us and saying you know we're not uh, we, we don't deserve to you know have our place in society. Yeah. Um, well, I will just respectfully amend what you said and say that we've never had free speech. Um, we've only ever had it in practice and in principle. We've never actually had it legislated the way the United States does. The United States has it. Um, yes, I'm aware of that. Yes, it has it written in law. So because their constitution actually states it, it's the first, it's the very first um, amendment or whatever the word is that they use. Whereas we don't have that. So even though we have it in practice and in principle, we can easily lose it, and we're very quickly probably going to end up becoming an autocratic society like the UK seems to be becoming very much uh, V for Vendetta, that kind of, I, I feel like that's where we're headed. Um, but we're still at the inception of it. So there's there's a chance and we can be optimistic because people are fighting back. Um, I was recently at a rally, uh, not not two, not two Saturdays ago, you know, fighting for, um, to, to avoid the Islamization of Australia and fighting for Israel. I was with Avi Yemeni and a group of others and um, it was unfortunate that you know, the, the pro-Israel side was 40 people and the pro-Palestine side was like, I'd say 400, 500 people. It was, I'm bad at estimating, so don't take those numbers as possible. But our side definitely had 40 and their side was a lot bigger. So it, it, it is, it's pretty disheartening to see that. But um, at the same time, uh, we do need to fight for our freedom of speech and it's happening. There are numbers there are, there, and there are groups that are growing and you're an alternative media and you're a good example of people who are speaking out. Um, 
you know, you and I in our own small way are, are trying to make a change. And we have um, people like Andrew Bolt, Mike Latham, Rita Panahi. We have these high profile uh, non lefties who are who are also trying to to affect this change. So there's hope. There's there's reason to be optimistic. So even though I think um, there's we are we will self implode, um, I'm hoping I'm wrong. Well, one silver lining in the world has been uh, U.S. President uh, Donald Trump. Now, uh, I know that you mentioned in one of your videos you uh, initially supported Carly Fiorina, right? I initially supported True. myself, uh, Ted Cruz. Uh, but, yes, uh, I like we, him. We, we both eventually got on the, the Trump train, and uh, I, I don't know about you, but he kept growing on me. Like, I enjoyed the circus at the, at the beginning, how he was making a spectacle of anything. Yeah. It, but probably when I start started taking him seriously and said, well, wow, he's got the answers, was uh, uh, when, he, when he announced his proposed uh, Muslim ban, I was like, wow, you know, it's a radical solution, true. but, mm. you know, at least he's proposing something and it was probably after the uh orlando massacre when i was that's when i was 100 percent sold on trump yeah i had i had um had trump in the corner of my eye the whole time i did um partly because milo i was such a milo fanatic at the time i still love milo but um you know i, I i'm trying i'm trying less to idolize people and trying more to focus on ideas there's something new that i'm trying but um he kept saying the whole daddy, daddy, daddy thing. And so I, I always had him in mind. I always kept looking at him and hearing him and thinking, oh, that's funny. But at the same time, Dr. Ben Carson and Carly Fiorina would have been my two. Those were my two. But, um, yes, uh, Senator Cruz is also really great. I love watching him debate people. He just destroys them. But, um, yeah, I ended up back on – I ended up on the Trump wagon, one, because he won. Two, because um, I like the fact that he used to be – someone who would have considered himself a Democrat and he was speaking for unborn babies. And I'm like, that takes a lot for a man to do that. And not, not to, not to speak out against men. That, that's not what I mean at all. Just that in general, um, it's embarrassing to say that like in this day and age, it's embarrassing for, from, for someone who was a Democrat or a lefty anyway, to be like, I'm now Republican. I'm for God. I'm for Christians. I'm for this. I'm for unborn babies and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't take him seriously because a lot of things he said I found to be, as you said, a circus. But um, he's done a great job, except for the Syria, the Syria thing. I'm not, I'm not pleased. Yeah, he's definitely let us down on that front. But on that I front, know, yeah, and I know a lot of uh, my libertarian friends who've always been critical of Trump have said, "Ha ha, yeah, he eventually uh, let you down." And I always respond by saying, "So well, retarded to say that." Uh, but uh, we, we would have got, uh, got guaranteed war with Hillary Clinton. At least we've probably right. made it by uh, about a year. Overall, I think Trump has been a, a positive uh, mm. influence. Uh, the U.S. economy is, is yes, going well, and it is. and I think uh, probably one of the most important things that he's done in the United States is. Uh, just disregard the the climate change religion. It, it's all about you know making sure that you know energy uh, security and uh, manufacturing return, returns to the United States. It's it's certainly uh, much more than we would have gotten under Hillary Clinton, who said she wanted to put coal miners out of business. And he's recognised and validated the state of Israel, which I think is fantastic. He's building that beautiful wall. It's doing a lot. <laughs> It's not. It's not. It's not up yet. The wall. He's. He's. Yeah, he's that, I said. He's built. I said it started. It's. He's building. It has finally started. Yeah. Well, yeah. He's. He's got to make sure that's built by by twenty twenty. Yes, Mexicans. Mm-hmm. Well, you're uh, part Latina, <laughs> so you're not. <laughs> you're not. You're I'm not offended by that. the wall. No, I'm not offended by the wall because every single hum, human, every single race of humanity out there has bad and has good. There are white people who rape, there are white people who are very against rape and think it's disgusting. Just the same with Mexicans. And I'm Colombian and Spanish and I can admit, actually, as a first generation Australian, um, I, I would say even more that uh, my parents jumped all the right hurdles. They, they came into Australia officially, they jumped all the right hurdles, they did all the right things. So these Mexicans that are doing it the wrong way and not jumping those right hurdles and just trying to get in and try and take advantage of, of, of the Western world's uh, resources. Learning English takes costs money. Um, getting uh, welfare takes money from, from taxpayers. All these things have not been earned. So do it the right way. 
because my parents did it the right way. I'm here. I've assimilated. I've done all the right things, and stop, you know, and don't rape people. My God, like, I think, I think, um, as a first generation Australian or an American or whatever, I, I, I probably um, can have more of an opinion than anyone else because, um, yeah, it's not offensive in any way. And there's actually a whole, a whole faction of people called Latinos for Trump. So yeah. No, I'm I'm for the wall. I'm for the wall. Uh, now, prob uh, you mentioned at the beginning that one of your uh, hot button issues that you talk about is uh, feminism, and you can probably uh, bash feminism more than me since you uh, you are a woman. Uh, in my, well, there are male feminists. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that, that's true. Uh, the, uh, and I always make sure that I don't confuse like feminism with. Uh, gender equality. I think actually gender equality has become actually uh, a good term because feminism has just become so obsessed with, well, not just man-hating, but blaming men for everything. Like, mm -hmm. for example, if there's not enough women in STEM, uh, then it must be because there's some, you know, secret patriarchal scientists who, you know, are telling all sexist jokes in the workplace, uh, scaring them off. And it's also been about victimology as well, not empowerment. Like they, mm. they, they don't want husbands, these feminists, but they want, seem to want government to be their new husbands. They want, I, I want, you know, government to fund like all my um, pet causes. And it, it's just the reverse of what feminism is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I think I agree with what you said. Um, I find even though the term gender equality is a good term, it's still not practical. It's not realistic because if you think about it, you can't treat every single person equally. I'm not going to treat a person who is blind the same as a person who is completely able-bodied. So I, I believe in treating everyone right. I don't necessarily believe that you can treat everyone equally. I'm going to talk to an older person who I respect and who I've known for years very different to the way I would talk to my best friends. There's, there's, there, there, I think we need to be... Uh, I'm, I'm coming from it very literally, and I... I, I just in case people want to be like, oh, she's against gender equality. No, not technically. But, I mean, you're not going to put um, a woman in the boxing ring with Mike Tyson. Like, you're just not. And as much that there, the gender equality wouldn't make sense there because there's no equality there. He would beat the shit out of me if I, if I, if I was put in the ring with, with Mike Tyson. Like, it just it doesn't work. So even though, yes, I'm for, I'm, I'm for equal opportunity, and, and maybe um, that's the correct word. Maybe, yeah. And um, overall, yes, of course I would say gender equality, yes, of course, for the most part. But in terms of literalness and practicality, I would, I would say that everyone should be treated right. Um, that, that's my stance on that. So I would, I'd say I'm anti-feminist. I say that just really to annoy people. But I could easily say, yeah, I'm a feminist. I could say that very easily if I was in the, if I was in the Middle East and um, I wanted women to stop being treated the way they're treated there. I could easily say I'm a feminist there. But we're not in the Middle East. I'm in Australia. And um, we have it pretty good here, so I am not a feminist. And, and we're not in the 1960s anymore either. I remember exactly. when I watched, started watching Mad Men and the, the way they treated women there was appalling. And yeah. uh, I was thinking, if, thank God that's not the, the case uh, anymore. And yeah. uh, it's not because, you know, we're, we're not anti-feminist because, you know, we've got this raging hatred of women. It's just because no. it's, uh, we, don't, we don't like, it's basically turning uh, gender on its head by saying that, you know, we need to oppress men now. We, we need to diminish them. And it's called the, the overcorrection uh, principle that because things yeah. are so bad for one side, we need to basically level it out over-level it to, to one side than the other. You're right. That's exactly what's happening. It's like, yeah, the overcorrection principle, um, they're trying to right the wrong by punishing people today that had nothing to do with, what, with it generations ago. It's the same thing with um, black people and reparations and the Aboriginal. It's, it's the same thing, only that it's, it's women now um, holding men down and the men are allowing it because like, yeah, you know, it happened in our past. Well, you, you weren't responsible, you idiot. It's stupid. Yeah, you're very right about that. Uh, and, of course, then there's the whole concept of rape culture, which uh, has the effect of... Which only being... exists in Islamic countries. Uh, or in the, in the West. It, 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 I'm not sure if you've looked at... Uh, the, I'm going to mention the Human Rights Commission again. They had their sexual assault and 
harassment report last year, which included things such as uh, staring Canada's sexual harassment or uh, talking to a woman, complimenting her, that, that Canada's uh, sexual harassment. And in, in the West, you know, nobody <laughs> likes, you know, rape. It's, it's considered one of the most vilest acts. And uh, that's that's another side effect. These feminists are diminishing it. Like they complain now that you know some radical MRA is saying I'd never uh, f- b- believe a woman who cried rape. Well, you know that's a side effect of you know what you know you've basically done to what should be a black and white issue. Agreed completely. Um, yeah, ditto for everything you just said. Um, there is definitely no rape culture, not here in the West. And if there is. It's probably a very small, I don't know, it, it doesn't exist. It can't exist. It definitely exists in, in the Islamic world, but no one can speak about that because the left is married to, to Islam and because the two have married, they, they're trying to sort of teeter, teeter on some sort of a weird line that they, that they don't know how to penetrate properly. So they, they sort of keep their, their respective distance but still work with each other. But um, yeah, there's no rape culture. Um, I, I don't really know what to say about that because, um, except to say that there's a lot of fake, false accusations that a man, a white man, went to jail uh, for seven years until it was discovered that the heifer that he apparently raped lied. I mean, who would want to rape her? She was disgusting. Um, I Stephen remember Crowder, that story. Yeah, Stephen Crowder did a whole article on her. I think he did a whole. Um, not a whole episode on her, but he, he mentioned it in one of his uh, shows. But uh, yeah, uh, I just I, look, I I think I don't think rape is evil, but I think it's in a different way. It's just as evil to maybe not the same evil, but it's still pretty damn evil to accuse a male of of doing that, knowing we know the reason that sorry, this is coming to me now. The reason we we react so much to to rape is because we all subconsciously know that men are physically stronger than women. So the thought of that is is, is so taboo and it, and it violates us and it unsettles us. So of course when, when you find out that a man has done that to a woman, you're going to react and that person's going to be um, in, the court of, 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 in the court of popular opinion. Their life is destroyed. It's, it's, it's horrible. And even if, if it ends up that, that they are found to be completely uh, free of any guilt and that they did nothing wrong and that, you know, they wasn't... There will still be people that will demonize them. Um, it's really bad. Yeah, sorry, I, I went on a tangent because I got really angry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I'm I'm glad that you you got that rush there. Yeah. Now uh, another issue, both you and me are on the same page, is on abortion, and we're on uh, the same page about a lot of things. It seems. Yeah. Oh, right, so uh, although we are uh, disagreeing from yeah. from time to time. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Now, what really uh, upsets me about where we are in this abortion debate is that you're not even allowed to advocate for life anymore. Uh, uh, In our state of Victoria and in Tasmania, abortion is allowed up until birth and you're not even allowed to uh, hand out uh, information outside abortion clinics now to women to say, hey, maybe you know, there's, a, there's another option uh, for you. And for the other side, they're called pro-choice, but they're basically uh, pro-abortion or pro- uh, pro-death. They're, 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 almost like, they're almost like, to me, when a woman does get an unplanned pregnancy, their inner ear saying, abort, abort, abort. Um. I will be honest before I continue on this particular train. Uh, I've done most of my research regarding abortion and it's all American knowledge that I have. So you just said to me, and I didn't know that, that um, in this country, at least in Victoria, you can abort up to the ninth month. I did not know that. I thought it was to the third month. I've been told it was the third month. I have friends who are nurses who said it's to the third month and that you can only go beyond if the child has some sort of... Um, it's if, it's if it's if you have so a permission shocking. from from two doctors. It's after I believe twenty four weeks. It can still happen if it has the uh, if it has the permission of two doctors. So it, it's it's a bit harder. But if a doctor is willing to sign up on it, it can happen until birth. Until the ninth month. Yeah. So the woman just has to change her mind and be like, "Oh, I don't want it anymore." And the two doctors, if they happen to say yes and they sign off on it, that baby can be killed. Hypothetically, that can happen. Dear God. Um, well, this is my issue. If abortion has to exist, which I don't think 
it should, but um, I do think it needs to be a viable option for ectopic pregnancies and things of that nature. Um, sometimes uh, abortion is um, a necessary medical issue, but um, outside of that particular caveat, um, it should not be allowed. Women who have sex should just shove a cork in it and stop because honestly, it's it's very easy to avoid pregnancy. It's so many, there are so many old people say, well, I'm pro-choice. What about pro the choice of a condom? What about pro the choice of um, not having sex? What about pro the choice of adoption? What about pro the choice of um, birth control? They're pretty, they're a pretty good amount of choices, but you're choosing a choice that that takes a choice away from the little child, and it's your child, it's your baby, you know, and that's a separate human being with separate DNA. Um, what kind of a, a mother chooses to kill her kid? I don't understand that. And at the same time, I've interviewed um, a young lady on my channel, and I understand that uh, they're not really given those options. They're not told. Yeah, that, that's the, the point that I was making before, that yes. it seems to be that they're only told your option is abortion. Yeah. I, yeah, I, right, lis right. I listened to that, that, that interview, and uh, the, the woman said, well, you know, if the other options had been you know, presented to me, maybe if my family was a bit more supportive, I would have had the child. Yes, and, and she's now, um, she's a friend of mine, and she's now had an ovary removed just due to life and stuff that happens. So she's got one ovary left. Um, that's two chances she had to have had a kid, and she, she, she didn't have it. And the thing is, too, the left and the media really does indoctrinate you to believe that it's a clump of cells, it's just tissue, but it's not true. By the ninth month, your heart that they, they have a heartbeat. That's the ninth month. They have a heartbeat. Sorry, ninth week, ninth tenth week. They have a heartbeat. Ninth week, I meant to say. Um, it's quite intense to think about. And countries like the UK and Australia, as you very um, aptly stated, they have doctor intervention. You can't just say, "I want it." You can't just go to a Planned Parenthood type company and then pay some money and get it taken out. You need to be. You need to be counselled. Um, a, and a doctor has to make um, the decision alongside you. And um, even though they don't present you with the options, at least it's it's a little bit harder. And I give props to Australia for that, at least. But the third month is still too far. It should be if that portion has to exist, it should be in the first month, because by three months they're already. It's like they're a quarter of the way there. The little I don't know it makes me sad. <laughs> Now, another uh, issue that we face in Australia is uh, immigration. Well, getting mm. the, the immigration mix uh, right. Obviously, uh, the main concern uh, for, for a lot of Australians has been Islamic uh, immigration. There was a poll a couple of years ago that said 49% of Australians wanted a ban on uh, Muslim immigration, but uh, we're both residents of Melbourne, and uh, yeah. another um, group has uh, popped up with, immigrant group with problems, and that's the, the Sudanese with the, the crime wave that seems to have burst Intense. onto the scene over uh, over the summer. And I, I'm, you know, I'm pro-immigration, but it has to be to, to benefit us. I mean, we have to be getting something out of it. I mean, yes, there are oppressed people all around the world, but you know, we, we can't make it worse for ourselves to, to accommodate these people. It's got to be, you know, we've got to look after us first. It's, it's like tr Trump said, country first. Yes. Well, he should really stick to that then, shouldn't he? Um, <laughs> I quite agree with you. I'm, I'm not against immigration at any capacity, but I do think uh, when people say that it's racist to not let in people because they're Muslim, or oh, you're not letting them in because they're Muslim, that's racist. It's not racist. It's, it's, it's um, first of all, not all Muslims are Middle Easterners. Um, a lot of them are from Africa, a lot of them are like Lindsay Lohan, they become Muslim. It's, it is what it is. So that in itself is a stupid argument. Um, and secondly, the we should have the creme de la creme of, of the immigrants that come. You know, my father, made, you know, he learned English. Uh, he, he, he's, he's worked as an interpreter. You know, you, you want people who will benefit your society. Um, and, that's, and that's how it's always been. 
So to, to, to then um, choose to, to, to not allow someone in because, you know, they're, what if you're letting in a drunk who hits his wife every day or something to that, you know, are, are we supposed to adopt that problem here now? And then, and then, you know, and that guy doesn't work and he only wants to come here so he can take benefits from the government. No, don't, don't let, don't let um, those sorts of people in. Like bring in people who are doctors, bring in people who are really smart or bring in cleaners who will, who will just, you know, want to work really hard. Um, I'm happy for Middle Easterners to come to Australia, but um, let's, let's, let's close the door on the Muslim immigration and, you know, up the door on the Yazidis and, and the Christians and, they're, they're also persecuted. Let, let's 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 help them. Let's help the white South African farmers. Like let's yes, help but, the other kinds of immigrants. Like I'm all for it. Yeah, that's really come to the uh, forefront uh, in Australia. The the persecuted Thanks. white South African farmers. Now, yeah, uh, I like to say, uh, you know, I was you know on on this issue before it burst down to the mainstream. I think it, we I first published. Too. Uh, an article early uh, 2017, which uh, which is good to to see it finally gain ma Amazing. mainstream a attention. But of course, thanks the to left, Lauren Southern. Yeah, the the left have said that oh, you know, you know, wanting to let in these white South Africans, it means you're it's a, 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 a white supremacist. But I always like yes, I would prefer to take in white South Africans over the Rohingyas, for example, because you know white South Africans they're able to integrate into Australia pretty. I'd say perfectly. I, I, it's a similar Anglosphere country to our, ours. We play rugby and, and cricket with them. I, I, I do Coming want up. to help the Rohingyas as well, but I think uh, the way that I come to that, I'm just using them as an example, is we'd be better yes. off the Australian government making sure they're safe in neighbouring Bangladesh, which is a Muslim country. They'd probably have a better life there with people of the same religion as them. That's a very good conclusion you've, you've reached, which I've actually stated before in um, a previous live stream, that uh, the Rohingya or the Yazidis or any other group that is um, persecuted in the Middle East, it is actually um, more incumbent upon the host country to, to bring them in. It will cost us more money to save them by bringing them here than relocating them to another area of the Middle East that is safer um, that that would be actually a lot cheaper for us and it would be better for them psychologically it would be better for them economically it would be better for them in every which way because they would understand the way that particular culture works they wouldn't have to readapt relearn maybe relearn the language um depending on where you relocate them but um that is absolutely the better option i completely agree with you and um yeah so for immigration and not for some now, as you stated at the beginning, you're uh, a Christian, uh, you're non-denominational. I myself uh, am an atheist, but we seem to have gotten along quite well. But there has been, from both uh, believers and non-believers, a concern about uh, declining uh, religious observance in the West. Uh, obviously, there has been quite a number of setbacks for organised religion, no, no more so than child sex sexual abuse. We had the uh, Royal Commission in Australia, which really uh, uh, sunk people's, uh, I guess, faith in, faith in the, the church. But of course, we, without strong institutions like the church, they, they still do a lot of good things with uh, charity, uh, youth, youth work and social work, and it, it has led to uh, more uh, creeping into our society, uh, a culture of degeneracy and more uh, loose morals. Yeah, it's very, um, makes my heart very happy to hear you say, I kind of got the vibe you were an atheist, but um, it didn't, I don't know, what you just said, it was very nice the way you said it, and um, it's very nice to hear atheists acknowledge that because so many atheists would still marry themselves to the left and to Islam, whereas you seem to be more on the sort of Stefan Molyneux camp. It was like, he even said on Dave Rubin, he said, I was a very militant atheist and I was very critical of Christianity, but he regrets his militantism because he's now seeing the value of, of what Christianity does bring to a society, which many people for the longest time have said, no, well, Christians this and Christians that, and they're not good because they're trying to make us this and make us that, and, um, well, the alternative isn't, isn't, isn't better. Every single society that has a Christian Judeo foundation is a better society. 
Well, what you said at the beginning was, was I'll, I'll go back to that, how there was Christians and atheists fighting for quite a while, but then there was some sort of truce. I think that's because both sides realized that the social justice warrior was a threat to uh, mm. all of them, and so they I teamed so up for, for the time being. Uh, I, I still, I, I've noticed in the, the anti-SJW community that there is still quite a hard hardline atheist uh, stance to them. Uh, but uh, so there is still this uh, divide. It, se it seems to be, and I think we're around about the, the same age, uh, around about in the early 2000s, that's when the uh, religious culture war was at its at its forefront, where the military yeah. atheists were saying our freedom is being threatened by this fundamentalism, and uh, a lot of Christians were still fire and brimstone, uh, you're going to hell. A lot of them were like that, yeah. Yeah. But, but, but we seem to have uh, overcome that, and I think you mentioned Stefan Molyneux, but probably a better example is uh, Richard Dawkins. He's really uh, come around. He used to be Mr. Atheist, but now realises that, you know, Christianity, I, I can work with that. Yeah, actually, that, I didn't know that. I didn't know that Richard Dawkins had lightened up. That's nice to hear. Um, he was someone that I was a fan of to a degree, but also not a fan. Like with Bin Mark, I have a sort of love-hate relationship with them because I'm like, why are you so, so mean towards this particular group of people in society that do so much to help people despite the hatred that comes at them? They still persevere and they still continue doing what they what they do. Uh, yeah, there was. There is definitely people on the left, people like, uh, this is the only two that come to mind, um, I'm sure there are better examples than this, but like uh, Steve Shives and uh, Christy Winters, they, they, they'd rather stay married to the left and, and, and married to the idea that uh, Islam is somehow, I guess, more beneficial to society than Christianity. Yeah, so it's, I, I'm glad to see people like, uh, let's say, Joe Rogan and Stephen Crowder you know, come together and agree on a lot of things. These are is a good these are good partnerships that that happen. So, um, you know, it's now it's now not about uh, it's not about religion at the moment. It's it's ideologies and it's left versus right. It's um, conservative versus liberalism. When I say liberalism, I mean American liberalism. I don't mean Australian conservative liberalism. Now, probably one issue I'm going to disagree with you on a bit, and it's probably an issue that uh, divides probably the modern right, and that is uh, Israel. Uh, you're uh, a great supporter of uh, uh, Israel, and it seems to be that yes. the civic nationalists, they, they, they very much see Israel and the Jews as our allies in uh, the fight against you know, uh, Islam and other aggressive ideology, but then you have the white nationalists who... Uh, it's, uh, you could almost call it the the the, the Mel Gibson uh, philosophy that the Jews are responsible for everything wrong in the world. They they run the Illuminati, the uh, the the banking now. Uh, the Rothschilds. I, yeah. Now I've I'm someone. Yeah, where do you stand? Yeah, I'm somewhat in the middle of that. I do believe that Israel is a you know great Western country, uh, but it's not our fight. Uh, I I believe that it's not worth. Uh, us in the in the West, you know, getting into basically World War Three to, to to save this country. It's it's not something we should uh, con concern ourselves with. And uh, I I think it it has skewed our foreign policy priorities a bit in the wrong direction. You could be very right about um, that that last point that it um, it could skew um, in the wrong direction. However, I I do believe that Israel is the source. To, to our Christian Judeo values. And if that is messed up, this is just my view, if that gets messed up, being what I think is the source of, of what we have today, then everything else would be gone. So that's that's the perspective I'm coming from. So if if Islam becomes if Islam becomes uh, if if it penetrate if it's if if it penetrates somehow the 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 Israeli way of life and, and everything that they have built, the agriculture the infrastructure, the science, the, the medical advances. If, if, if Islam takes over, it will regress. And if, if Israel regresses, the world regresses. I, I do believe that. And it probably sounds really dumb to some to me to say that. But um, that's, just, that's just a perspective that I hold because I do think that without Israel, without Jews, without um, – they're so intelligent. They're just known that way. Stephen Molyneux – 
said something to the, to the effect that they are considered intellectually the highest IQ of all races. If the Islamic neighbors just said, hey, help us with our land, do this, do that, let's all work together, there would, there would be no issues. But people keep bowing. The, the, the Israelis keep saying, what if we give you this? Is this, is this a good treaty? No. Well, what if we give you this much land? No. What if we give you this? No. They just keep saying no, 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 no. They're not, they're not willing to try. So people keep saying, well, Israel's responsible for, for this and for that, and they're doing all these things that are wrong, and it's an apartheid state, and free Palestine, and all these things like that. How much does Israel have to bow down and try help? They've done so much. I'm not saying that they're perfect. They've done a lot of things wrong, too. I read an article about it. It's on um, the National Independent, if anyone wants to catch it. Um, I write articles for the Imam of Peace. Um, so I've, I've, I've researched this quite extensively. Um, but look, that's just where I stand on it. I think that um, we, it might not be our problem. And you're probably right about that. But at the same time, if, if, if something happens to Israel, it's not long before the rest of the world is in danger, particularly white, Western, Christian ideal countries. I'm pretty confident that given well, what I see from like, their leader Netanyahu, I'm pretty, and its uh, strength of defending itself over its 70 years of existence, I'm pretty sure that uh, they can uh, ta ta take care of themselves. They've done a pretty good job. And I've, uh, they I can. Probably, yeah. And I don't have. Uh, I obviously disagree that our fate is tied to uh, Israel. Uh, we're, okay. we've, got a, we're, we've got a pretty uh, tough fight in our hands here in Australia with uh, the, the same problems that Israel faces. And, you know, we may be in the same battle as them, but you know, separate battlefronts. Yes, I, I see your perspective. I really do. But um, I'm looking at it from, from a lens of, of the future. I don't know how to word it. I worded that horribly. But basically, I'm looking at it um, in every every single which way possible. And that's what I believe. I believe that ultimately if Israel is, is destroyed, um, every other Western society will be destroyed, particularly if Islam ends up taking over. Well, I'm sure, Dee, we could keep talking. Uh, I would have liked to have probably explored these topics uh, uh, a lot more with you, but uh, it's probably best to leave it at there for uh, today. Uh, keep up the great work, and we'll certainly uh, be in contact and hopefully have a, another on-air chat uh, sometime in the future. Oh, I'd love that. I really enjoyed myself. Thank you so much for having me. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. I would like to encourage all of you to subscribe to Dee's YouTube channel as there is plenty of content to keep you enlightened and entertained. As you know, The Unshackled has been busy covering events on the ground in Melbourne, the videos of which, including highlights, speeches and interviews, are now on our YouTube channel. There was the Walk with Jalal on Sunday the 15th of April as part of the Justice for Jalal campaign. A year ago, 13-year-old Jalal Yazin Naja was hit and killed by a suit Sudanese mother who only received 80 hours community service. We also recently covered the Rally Against Safe Schools Victoria on Saturday the 21st of April to take a stand against uh, the program and others that sexualize young children. It was organized by the Coalition Against Unsafe Schools Education. The next upcoming event we intend to cover is the Stop Melton Mosque and Islamic Centre, which is occurring at the next Melton City Council meeting on Monday the 30th of April at 6.30pm. It is being organised by the Australian Liberty Alliance and Avi Yemeni. Melton is where an Islamic housing estate was planned, so there is a significant push to Islamize the area. It is the suburb also where the True Blue crew was formed in opposition to such plans. Our friends at Liberty Works have got another big event coming up. It's a Jew, Muslim and Christian walk into a bar featuring Avi Yemeni, Imam Tawidi and Kiralee Smith with Professor James Allen as the devil's advocate. It's on Thursday the 17th of May at 7pm at the Mount Gravett Bowls Club in Brisbane. Sydney and Melbourne events so will be announced shortly. Tickets can be bought at libertyworks.org.au. Also, don't forget, if you want to take The Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Also, don't forget, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.